The commission withdrew from all negotiations. Now the lives of Joe McDonnell and his fellow hunger strikers were hanging in the balance. And the only thing that would save them was the Republican leadership making a deal directly with the British government. By June 1981, as the hunger strike entered its 13th week, four Republican prisoners had already starved themselves to death. But through the secret line of communication known as the Mountain Climber, the British government had made an offer to the Republican leadership. The question now was whether a deal could be done. The main worry that the prisoners had at that time was the British government would offer them the sun, the moon and the stars. But it would be merely an offer, it would never be tied down, and the prisoners wanted that guaranteed. Therefore, it was agreed that I would go into the jail on the Sunday when there was no visits. There was a big reaction against that whenever I entered the prison, very cold atmosphere from the prison officers. Uh, one senior officer turned around and said, this is a fucking sellout. What's that bastard doing in here? And he was ordered to, to, to shut up. I can remember them was coming in or being told that they were coming in because they were banned. They were barred from coming into the jail. The way we looked at it was it was, it was a sign of good faith on the part of the British. The fact that they were allowing Danny in was the beginning of the movement towards a resolution. Danny Morrison, who's one of the most eminent and articulate of Republicans of this generation, was part of the group outside the jail which was involved in dealing with the issue of the strike and if Morrison was visiting the jail that meant something serious was afoot. I went in and uh, I think it was about eight people there. Joe McDonald was brought in as well and Joe was, had gone blind and was in a wheelchair and uh, he asked me about what you know the proposals and we told him what they were offering at that stage and they said, well, we want it guaranteed. I think it is clear that there was a serious offer, or at least the basis for a serious offer being made at this time, and that it's one which came about as close as the British were going to yield. I think it gave most of what the Republicans wanted in substance. The question of whether or not by this stage, after there being four deaths, Republicans felt they had to hold out for all five, hold out for victory or nothing. It was a difficult one. They wanted someone, either a British minister or someone senior from the NIO to come in and to state what was on offer. And if that was stated, if it was guaranteed, then there was real prospect of the hunger strike end. In an attempt to clarify the situation, the government agreed to send an official from the Northern Ireland office into the Mays prison. He was due to arrive at 8.30 in the morning of Wednesday, the 8th of July. But just four hours earlier, the fifth prisoner, Joe McDonnell, died on hunger strike. And as McDonnell's life ended, so too did any hopes of a deal. I remember just hearing Joe was dead, and I was just totally wiped. Wiped. As far as I was concerned, the whole thing had collapsed. The opportunity was lost. The problem for me was that we had gone beyond the Rubicon. We were now into a protracted hunger strike, which was going to be impossible, virtually impossible, to get away from unless you put the hands up. I was in the cell myself with Brandon Hughes, and I remember discussing the whole thing with him. We, we argued the point with others, you know, is it necessary to go on, you know, have we, I haven't made the point, you know, and what's going on here, why is this here being prolonged, and these issues should be debated, what, I mean, what, what has to be gained now, but nothing more will be gained from one other death, and the whole thing become very, very politicised with the elections. We had Paddy Agnew, Cian Doherty being elected, be a big massive thing, this was so changing the very, very nature, and became more electoral. It became more of an electoral strategy than it did a sort of strategy of the haste blocks. We'd move from that door into something else, and it seemed to be being manipulated by people who started to see the gains that could be made. By July, five hunger strikers were dead, 
but two of their fellow prisoners have been elected as TDs in the Dáil. Sinn Féin's election gamble was reaping rewards, and as its campaign on the streets gained momentum, tension continued to rise. Well, there was an overflow effect down here. We had 5,000 people marching the British Embassy, mainly from Northern Ireland, IRA people, with, um, to attack the Gardaí, which they did. If they had broken through, the army was the next line of defence, and a confrontation between the army and demonstrators is never a thing you want to happen. Clearly, these were organised riots. They were not spontaneous gestures of sympathy. People who were brought out by the Republican movement were organised by the Republican movement and given what they were up to elsewhere at that time. Uh, one could never be sure how far they would go and how far they would attempt to go. We had had the burning down of a British embassy. We had had the murder of a British ambassador. And here we were seeking to maintain some sort of balance in the relationship between Dublin and London, now faced with uh, pretty ugly scenes. Happily, you know, the worst did not happen, but nevertheless, there were some scary moments in the summer of 1981. With still no sign of a deal, and with street fighting in the south, and IRA and British Army shootings in the north, the crisis was deepening. It seemed just a matter of time until the next man died on hunger strike. Shortly after Joe MacDonald had died, um, Martin Herson was the, ne the next prisoner who was uh, into the 40-odd 40 40 day mark. And uh, it, it was actually a shock. And it shocked everybody that Martin had died because nobody expected that. We, we weren't near a crisis period. And on the, the following Sunday, at Mass, Father Fall confronted me. And uh, I remember him. Um, this blistering row with him uh, over Martin Harrison. Father Fall came in and he knew Martin Harrison very well because Martin was from Tyrone and Father Fall had a parisher, he was a teacher there, and he was just incandescent with rage. And he came over to Beck and he just pointed at him and he said, You McFarlane, you kill Martin Harrison. And Beck went nuts was explosive and it really was hard and uh, it was a bad situation. I said you're putting men on who are not fit. I think Maggie Thatcher is the one that we need to talk about here who have us in this situation. Beck was jumping with rage and I had to get in between him and Fall and calm it down and the both of them were shaking over each other. I began to wonder, I said, what is the object of this strike? It was, it was explosive. Great, great publicity and recruitment for the IRA. Is it the funerals you want? Is it the funerals you want? Martin Herson became the sixth hunger striker to be buried in ten weeks, and the heavy toll was beginning to have an impact on the Republican movement. We used to speak about the conveyor belt prison. We were now on a treadmill to death. We were on a, a never-ending funeral. It almost felt as if we were caught in, in a, a, a vicious circle that we couldn't escape from. After a while, it became a tragedy that was, looked like it was unstoppable. But certainly from the outside, it looked to me like the concept of pride was infinitely more important than the concept of life. The more people died, the more and more we'd become entrenched. 
the more and more it was impossible for the British government to concede.